Horace Peckham is probably the most remarkable intellectual of the 20th century that you haven't heard of. By profession, he was an English professor, uh, but he tended to call himself a cultural historian, mainly because uh, this term didn't really have any, um, didn't mean very much when he was alive. Peckham wasn't a big fan of labels or disciplines. Peckham was a student of the arts early in his life, but over time became very well versed in psychology and philosophy as well. And his writings move around in these uh, different worlds. His major books fall into basically two camps. Uh, there are his analyses of European cultural history, focusing on the 19th century, especially Romanticism. These have names like Beyond the Tragic Vision, Victorian Revolutionaries, The uh, Birth of Romanticism, and The Romantic Virtuoso. Then there are his more general analyses of the human condition, with titles like Man's Rage for Chaos, Art and Pornography, and Explanation and Power. Peckham's intellectual background, by which I mean his background as an analyst of history and human behavior, was basically pragmatistic. Within pragmatism, he's probably closer to John Dewey, George Herbert Mead, people like that, uh, than, to, uh, than to William James, say, or Charles Sanders Peirce, although he does take up some of Peirce's semiot uh, semiotic language late um, into his own work. Late in life, he also recognized a certain intellectual kinship with the neo-pragmatist Richard Rorty. Peckham has a, a curious relationship to the kinds of behaviorism I've discussed in other lectures. The influence on him of Grace de Laguna's book, Speech, Its Function and Development, seems to me very striking. His relationship to B.F. Skinner is more ambivalent, however. Uh, Peckham shows some interest in Skinner's work in his early writings, but seems to have soured on him by the 1970s. This was the time when Skinner was becoming especially famous. His criticisms of Skinner at this time seemed to me a bit unfortunate, but in the end, not too important. Actually, uh, Peckham's writings share a lot with Skinnerian style behaviorism, most obviously because they focus on behavior. So Peckham, like Skinner, emphasized the continuity of behavior. Art and science, for example, are simply two kinds of behavior, continuous with, th uh, with things like telling dirty jokes, uh, farming. We can't say we've understood art or science until we understand them as things people do. And Peckham is also interesting to consider in light of what's been called the, uh, the linguistic turn in 20th century philosophy. Peckham was very concerned with language because he recognized that it's the medium through which all our scholarly analyses must take place. You can't begin your work unless you have a good theory of language and a good idea of what the words you use are doing. So throughout his mature work, you'll find many analyses, what I call uh, behavioral semantic analyses of abstract words like cause, culture, history, humanism, nature, personality, and the like. Of course, his semantic uh, behavioral analysis of the word mind will be important for this lecture. Peckham's most important book for us in thinking about mind is a book called Explanation and Power, the Control of Human Behavior. This is his most complete presentation of his theory of behavior, and it's an attempt to explain human behavior, he tells us, without relying on the concept of mind. He does, however, analyze the word mind and gives alternatives for understanding the activities or processes we normally associate with mind. So my uh, recommended reading for this lecture, if you wanna follow along more closely, is Morse Peckham's Explanation and Power, the Control of Human Behavior, especially the beginning part, the introduction in the first chapter. So I'll give a little bit of uh, background on Peckham before we really begin. Uh, he was born in 1914 in Yonkers, New York, and died in 1993 in South Carolina. As a child, he was exposed to many kinds of art and literature by his parents, no doubt influenced his career. His father, Ray Morse Peckham, by the way, was a pretty well-known optometrist. It's a bit of interesting trivia. Uh, Peckham described his parents as Victorians, which is interesting because uh, many of his scholarly writings analyze Victorian writers and artists. 
Uh, now, Peckham did his undergraduate study in English at the University of Rochester beginning in 1931, then moved to Princeton for graduate study in 1935. His degree was delayed, however, by his needing to earn money, so he had to work. And then by World War II, so Peckham was drafted into the army in 1941, deployed to England in 1943. He's not uh, involved in fighting, really, however. His most uh, important task during the war was to write the history of the 9th Bomber Command. And an interesting side note is that when the war with Germany ended, Peckham got drunk in Belgium with uh, Thomas Kuhn would go on to become an important philosopher. After the war, Peckham finally got his PhD. The most in, uh, important parts of his career then took place at the University of Pennsylvania and the Uni University of South Carolina. Although he was nominally an English professor at Penn, he was involved in some unusual projects, such as producing a variorum edition of Darwin's On the Origin of Species and directing a short-lived experiment in humanist, uh, humanistic education for business executives sponsored by AT&T. Both, both of these things happened in the 1950s. Peckham wrote some papers on romanticism during his early career, but did not publish a major book until Beyond the Tragic Vision in 1962. He was already 48 years old at this time, so kind of late in life, maybe. But now the floodgates seemed to burst open, and he was an, an incredibly productive writer until the end of his life. In 1967, Peckham moved to the University of South Carolina, where he remained until he retired. At the University of South Carolina, he was part of a loose group of very interesting scholars with related interests and perspectives. These included the sociologist Robert Stewart, political scientists uh, Peter Cederberg and William Kreml, and the literary scholar H.W. Matalin. I should note that among the many topics that he tackled, Peckham was an especially sharp critic of academia. And if you really want to get a sense of what kind of person he was, I suggest reading his writings on education and the university, which, which contains some of his most personal remarks and also some of his most humorous remarks. And on a, a personal note of my own, I'll mention that Peckham never married and had no close family surviving him after his death in 1993. I mention this because unlike many other prominent intellectuals, there is, as far as I've been able to discover, no archive or anything like that of Peckham's written materials, such as his things like manuscript, uh, manuscript drafts and letters. A few years ago, I made some efforts to discover what happened to his possessions after he died. Apparently, whatever was saleable was sold, and I've not been able to find out what happened to his personal papers. And maybe they were just tossed out, thrown away, but maybe they are sitting in someone's basement somewhere gathering dust. Anyway, it would be exciting if uh, any surviving documents were found and just made available to researchers or the public. So let's move on. I'm going to begin with Peckham's critique of the word mind. So a semantic behavioral analysis, analysis of the word mind. Peckham's general position was that before you begin investigating any supposed phenomenon, you need to take into consideration the word or, wor or words that you uh, use to talk about it does not follow that just because a particular word exists, there exists something in the world outside of language that the word refers to, or at least it doesn't follow that there is a particular thing or substance to which the word refers. Of course, uh, words are used in response to something, and language, be language behavior is a response to the world. For example, a word might not be a, uh, a word might not be a response to an apparently distinct thing, like a tree, but rather to some regularity of behavior, such as the fact that most people rely more on their right hands than their left hands. But right-handedness and trees are not things, 
in the same kind of way. This might give you a, a little clue as to how we can think about the word mind. The basic idea is that you need to figure out what people are responding to when they use a particular word. This is very similar to the Wittgensteinian doctrine that the meaning of a word is to be found in its use. And indeed, uh, Peckham was influenced by Wittgenstein. I should say that Peckham has an interesting theory of language. In fact, he has a whole semiotic theory or theory of signs. I mentioned a connection, a little bit of a connection with Charles Sanders Peirce before. Uh, I hope to talk about this in a future lecture, and, but I'm going to avoid getting too deeply into it here. But at least one part of that theory is important to recognize very clearly. This is that words are bidirectional. They have two related uses or they have two functions which work together in tandem. One, so one way we use words is to categorize the stuff of experience, whether that stuff is other words or whether it's uh, sounds, images, smells, and so on. When we categorize something by labeling it with a word, we're moving in the direction of abstraction. But we also use words to control our behavior with respect to things, especially to direct our attention to particular things. And this is moving in the direction of the, the concrete. If you ask me, what's that? And I say, it looks like some kind of tree. We're moving in the direction of abstraction. Right? We're moving away from a particular thing to a kind of a thing. Um, but if I say to you, hey, uh, hey, that looks like a cool tree over there. I'm asking you to notice something particular in the environment, to notice something concrete or empirical, something we can observe and see and touch, rather than something abstract. So we need to be aware that mind words are also going to have this bi-directionality or duality of function. Now, the mind is not an object in the usual sense. If you, re if you request that I bring you a mind, I will not be very sure what I should do. What should I do with that request? Uh, the question, what is the mind, is probably not a very useful one. Uh, there's not some segment of reality that we as a group can collectively hold up and say, ah, so this is a mind. Better questions uh, perhaps are, when the word mind is used, what am I being directed to look for? What is the appropriate way to respond to it? Or what does the word mind direct me to respond to? This may seem like a small difference, but consider. Uh, Descartes famously, famously said, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, or I am thinking, therefore I exist, something like that. Uh, many philosophers have taken this to mean that the, exist the existence of mind is certain. Therefore, an appropriate follow-up question is, what is this mind that we can be sure exists. But B.F. Skinner, who I talked about in another lecture, had an interesting perspective on this. He said, and let me quote, uh, Descartes, he, so he says, Descartes could not begin as he thought he could by saying cogito ergo sum. He had to begin as a baby, a baby whose subsequent verbal environment eventually generated in him certain subtle responses, one of which was cogito. So the word cogito, or thinking, was a learned or innovated response to some situation, some state of affairs, which occurred in a community of language users. So what situation is it a response to? What are we being told to observe? Let's go back to the word mind. One obvious answer to this question is that mind directs us to observe our own covert verbal and imagistic behavior, the words or visual or musical or other kinds of images that are created within us privately, presumably by our own nervous systems. When someone asks, what's on your mind? They're asking for a report on this kind of behavior. Is this kind of behavior we are being asked to respond to? We do not need to assume yet that there is a place called mind where this behavior occurs. 
The mind-body problem then derives from the fact that we use different terms to evoke uh, responses about different behaviors or conditions of the human organism. We use mind words to respond to, to categorize and draw attention to certain kinds of private events. And we use body words to uh, respond to other kinds of private events, such as activities of the heart or stomach, as well as most publicly observable behaviors and conditions of the organism. So uh, what's on your mind? What are you thinking about? What's your plan for tomorrow? And questions like this are all about one class of behaviors or conditions. But when the doctor asks you what hurts, she's asking about what is by social convention, a different class of behaviors or conditions. And this is one way to think about the mind-body problem. We simply categorize the words we use to talk about the organism in two different ways, as either mental or physical. So it's a language issue. And just to remind you, as I've mentioned in other lectures, we don't need to make too much of a mystery of the mind-body relation. If the organism as a whole can respond to stimuli on the external side of its skin, there's no good reason to think that it can't respond to stimuli within its skin. So a picture in the imagination is, in terms of our being able to respond, just as real as a picture hanging in a museum. Someone else talking to you is just as effectual as you talking to yourself. Uh, but mind language has uses beyond directing us to observe certain private events within ourselves. We might ask, why should we at all care about what's going on inside another person's mind? Or about what's going on inside of our own, for that matter? The answer has to do with predicting or managing or controlling behavior. Now, as Peckham points out, human behavior is both predictable and unpredictable. So he writes, if you put two individuals in the same situation, their observable responses will be different, at least sometimes, though at other times they will be the same. A similar assertion is that if you put the same individual twice into what you judge to be two situations sufficiently alike to be placed in the same category, then his behavior will be different on each occasion, or we might be the same. That is, the two behaviors will be sufficiently similar to be judged as appropriately placed in the same category, or so dissimilar as not to be so placed. What this boils down to is the proposition that human behavior is both predictable and unpredictable. All right, so mind, recall that mind is simply a word. We need to remember mind is, first of all, a word. And as a word, it is used to subsume and explain these two observations, that behavior is predictable and unpredictable. So sometimes a person behaves differently than we have come to expect. And we explain this by saying that she has changed her mind or had a different idea this time. But for the most part, I think, we observe that most people's behavior most of the time is roughly predictable within certain limits, or at least predictable in the ways that matter to us. And that the behaviors, and we notice that the behaviors of two people are different in roughly predictable ways. So we sometimes explain this by referring to their minds. If we say that a person has an interesting mind, as opposed to a boring mind, if we say someone has an interesting mind, we mean that her behavior is distinguishable from other people's behavior, first of all, and that it is distinguishable by being more interesting or surprising than the average, than the people with boring minds. If you say that someone has a beautiful mind, as in the, the well-known title of the book and movie about John Nash, you mean, again, that this person is different from other people who don't have beautiful minds and that the, the ways in which his behaviors are different from other people's have a certain attribute in common. In this case, the way his behavior is different is judged to be beautiful. Of course, if someone has a dirty mind, we all know that what that means, uh, we mean that his behaviors, especially his verbal behaviors, are different from other people's and that they often have a sexual aspect to them. 
So from observing regularities and irregularities and differences in behavior, we say that people have different kinds of minds or that they change their minds and things like that. So the word mind is commonly used to categorize the observation that behavior is both predictable and unpredictable. But just because a word can name a class of different things, it does not follow that the word names a thing which is a cause of those other things. This is what's known as the fallacy of hypostatization or reification. It's like saying that right-handedness causes people to be more skilled with their right hands, when really it just categorizes the observation that some people are more skilled with their right hands. Or in a similar way, we say that someone's behavior is good or bad, but we need not believe that their behavior is caused by goodness or badness, as if goodness and badness are things in the world like angels and devils on our shoulders, making us behave in certain ways. Indeed, this would arguably be a mistake if we really want to understand human behavior. So we should not assume that mind names an entity that has a causal relation to other entities. Maybe it's just a word that categorizes observations about people's behavior. But because mind is used to categorize behavioral, behavioral variability, and we mistakenly take it to be a cause of that variability, the question arises as to the relation between mind and reality, another famous problem in philosophy. So different minds must know reality differently, and that is why behavior varies, right? So one answer to this question is the Skinnerian one. It is well within the realm of observation that different people have different bodies, including different genes, and these bodies are themselves always changing. Likewise, it's clearly observable that people have different histories of reinforcement, as Skinner would say, and also that some people live in different societies with different norms of behavior. We don't need to posit an unobservable mind to explain behavioral vari uh, variability in relation to the environment. Now, I don't think Peckham would exactly disagree with this line of reasoning, but he's interested in something different. He's interested in the, the mind-reality relation for a different reason. Peckham points out that both mind and reality are highly regressive words, which is a more precise way of saying that they're very abstract words or very far away from the data of empirical experience. In this sense, the mind-reality re uh, relation is, in fact, nothing more than a relation between words. So there is the question um, about how words relate to the world. And we've seen that the word mind is a categorizing response to certain phenomena, as well as an instruction to observe certain phenomena. And there's also a, a question about how words relate to other words. So there's words related to the world, but also words related to other words. Um, the basic problem of epistemology then for Peckham is about how words relate to both other words and to non-words, or in his uh, technical jargon, how verbal signs relate to other verbal signs and to non-verbal signs. This, however, is getting into areas of, uh, areas of philosophy, which I'll save for another occasion. All right, so far I've focused on Peckham's critical analysis or behavioral semantic analysis of the word mind. But Peckham does have a replacement for the concept of mind in explaining behavior, which I uh, want to get to now. Uh, for Peckham, what is called the mind, as it functions or is thought to function in behavior, can be more precisely understood with the concept of semiotic transformation. This means the transformation of signs into other signs. This is what behavior is, according to Peckham. Peckham prefers the word sign to stimulus, so you're going to hear me use this word a lot. In other lectures, I've used the word stimulus. Here, you're going to hear the word sign. But the words are used in similar ways. 
Peckham uses sign partly for a cultural reason. He felt closer to the pragmatist semiotic tradition of Charles Sanders Peirce and Charles W. Morris than to the behaviorist tradition of Watson and Skinner. But the term is also helpful in emphasizing the categorical nature of our responsive behavior. We don't just respond to <clears throat> the particular qualities that we sense, but to categories that we divide the world into, such as things I can eat, people that I've met before, things I should not hit with my car, etc. Sign can perhaps better accommodate the categorical nature of experience than stimulus. Now, um, our behavior is always a response to something, whether that something be a sensation of heat or pain or light or a perception of language or an event in our social environment or a feeling of imminent danger, anything like that. These are all signs or complexes of signs to which we respond. Our responses can be thought of as semiotic transformations. This is because a response produces new signs, which are perceived at least by ourselves, but perhaps also by other people, if there are other people around. So our response produces new signs, and these new signs are perceived by us and by other people. A semiotic transformation is basically, as Peckham uses it, it's basically synonymous to semiosis as that term is used by Peirce and other semioticians in that tradition. But Peckham wants to emphasize that there are certain factors involved in the process of a sign being transformed through behavioral response into other signs. Peckham says in different writings that there are three factors in semiotic transformation, but he gives at least two different sets of these three factors. And uh, if we com combine them, perhaps we can say there are four factors. I don't know if you'd agree with that, but I find it useful to think in this way. So Pierce, you might know, uh, liked everything to be in triads. Everything is threes in Pierce. And maybe Peckham picked this up a little bit. But I don't mind things being in groups of four. And I find both of his sets of threes useful. You can combine them. Uh, so the four factors in semiotic transformation are these. So you have semiotic modality, that's one, semiotic modality. Um, the second, attributional preserva preservation, and then interest and style. I'm mainly going to focus on the last two, interest and style, but just run through the first two quickly. The first factor, semiotic modality, is like the medium. Does the response, the behavioral response, take place through speech or writing or gesture, guitar solo, anything like that? Uh, what is the, what's the medium? The second factor, attributional preservation, is about whether the response is similar in appearance to the originating sign. So does the response preserve any attributes or features of the sign? It's easier to think about this in art. So some landscape paintings, for example, we call very realistic, while others are more impressionistic or abstract. This gets at the idea of attributional preservation. Some responses preserve many attributes of the original sign, like in realism, a realistic painting, and some preserve none at all, like total abstraction, or when you switch uh, between speech and visual responses. When we talk about um, the last two factors, interest and style, we're getting into areas that people associate with mind. Interest is related to what Skinner means by reinforcement or Darwinians mean by adaptation. The interest of the organism is adjusting itself to its environment, which sometimes means adjusting its environment based on, uh, based on the properties it already has. In everyday language, we would say that we do something for a reason, and this reason affects how you do it. If you are hired to provide an illustration of, say, Mount Fuji in a certain style for a magazine, this will be a factor in how you respond to Mount Fuji. And you'll, and you'll end up with a, a different painting than if your interest was in 
it uh, was in trying out, say, a new technique or just in painting for relaxation after a, after a hectic work week. So that's interest. The, uh, the last factor is style. This is related to mind in the sense of variability of behavior. We've already talked about that a bit. So say that you uh, and another person were both hired to produce realistic paintings of Mount Fuji. Even if you both painted it from the same perspective and time of day and in the same weather conditions and et cetera, everything was the, basically the same, you'd still end up with paintings that looked different. Why? Well, Simply put, your different organisms, which implies all those uh, factors we've discussed with Skinner. You have different genes and different histories and different environments. All of these lead to what uh, Julian Jaynes called different aptic structures in your body. An aptic structure being a condition of the nervous system, giving the body a tendency and aptitude to respond in a certain way. Now, of course, uh, you could say that people respond differently because they have different minds or different mental states. But as we've seen, this does not get us very far in terms of an explanation. The advantage that Peckham's semiotic transformation, and especially his concepts of interest and style, has over uh, mentalism is that it helps us point to specific factors in the world that control behavior. We don't need to posit an unobservable realm of the mind. Certainly one's internal physical structures and one's cultural history may be hard to observe, but um, they're parts of material reality. That, in principle, we can observe them and we can learn more and more about them by using scientific methods. Now, going on, in my last lecture, or in my lecture on the Singerians, the Singerian behaviorists, uh, I mentioned the three C's of the mind, which are sometimes divided into three C's and one A. Uh, so cognition, conation, affection, and consciousness. In closing out this lecture, I want to briefly consider these from Peckham's perspective. Consciousness can be dealt with very quickly. Peckham, in short, was doubtful about the concept of consciousness. He once remarked that I am perfectly, so he said, I am perfectly willing to accept the notion of an unconscious mind, though I have very strong doubts about the usefulness of the notion of a conscious mind. Now, he didn't explain in detail what his objection was, and sometimes he just liked throwing out paradoxical statement, uh, statements, I think, to amuse or provoke his readers. You can find a lot of many statements like that in his writings. Uh, but we could maybe define consciousness in a Pecamian way as semiotic transformation about semiotic transformation. This is a phrase Peckham actually did use once or twice. And uh, this, of course, is what we have just been doing. So maybe we have been being conscious today. Um, other supposedly mental phenomena that he considers in behavioral terms are cognition and emotion, what some psychologists call affection or effective response. Uh, here, we need to understand something more about Peckham's theory of signs. Now, this is tricky because Peckham gives various accounts using different terminology. He was always changing, always adjusting, and trying to make things uh, more precise. So I'll try to streamline things a bit. A sign, according to Peckham, is just something in the world to which we respond. Perception is the organism organizing the bits of energy that stimulate its sense organs. Our, uh, our perceptions become the basis for our actions. Perception turns the world into signs to which we can then respond in behavior. The response itself has various aspects that we can analyze out. These are the cognitive responses of figuring out the, the meaning of a situation, uh, the meaning of a perception. So it's part of cognition. In other words, uh, given this sign in this situation, what kind of response is appropriate? The response will be some kind of semiotic transformation, either covert or overt, 
either externally observable or not very easily observable inside the organism. Uh, and there are further cognitive responses of judging whether the instructions provided by the sign have been carried out appropriately, appropriately in behavior. So given what I did, did it work? Did I get the response? Uh, did I get the reaction I wanted? Uh, but the response also has an emotional character. This is connected with whether the sign or the situation to which you are responding is interpreted as guidance or hindrance. So guidance or hindrance are two more important keywords for Peckham. The brain wants to control or manage the environment, including the body that immediately environs the brain. So the body is part of the environment of the brain, an important part of its envir environment. And it wants to, to control the environment for its own benefit, uh, its own benefit. And it does so by interpreting signs as instructions for the rest of the body. The environment can hinder or guide the brain's efforts at managing it. The reactions of the brain to guidance or hindrance cause chemical or muscular reactions in the body, which when they become perceptible, we call emotions. Maybe a very clear example is when you're trying to get somewhere quickly by car. I've had this experience so many times. Uh, or when your brain judges that it is to its benefit, in its benefit, to get somewhere at a certain time, but the time remaining seems not quite enough. So imagine there are 10 sets of traffic lights between you and your destination. These traffic lights can either be a hindrance or a guidance in this situation. I Probably everyone knows the feeling of trying to get somewhere quickly, but all the lights are red. How many times has that happened to you? The brain's interpretation of uh, these lights as hindrances has a physiological consequence that we label with negative emotional words like frustration or anxiety or despair. Will we ever get there? Uh, these responses are themselves instructions to search for new behaviors, such as praying that the light changes faster or considering a different route, etc. And if most of the lights are green, when they could just as well be red, we feel what gets labeled as positive emotions, such as joy. This is the feeling that a, so feelings like joy are feelings that a hindrance has been removed or that your behavior is guided by the environment rather than hindered. Okay, so, so far we've uh, just been talking about physical stuff taking part in physical processes, brains and bodies and the stuff around us in the environment. As with Skinner, we don't need to assume the existence of a, a separate thing called mind that causes other things to happen. Now, Peckham doesn't really give a good behavioristic account of subjectivity as you can find in Skinner, um, with his with Skinner's uh, talking about perceiving in the absence of an external support, or in Jane's Julian Jane's with his analog space that we in our brains learn to create. But I think such an account could be easily added to Peckham. Uh, be all this as it may, perhaps Peckham's most important contribution. This is what I would mainly want you to take away. His most important contribution, as far as mind is concerned, is his Wittgensteinian insistence that we analyze our own behavior in using mentalistic words in the first place. So what is it we are actually doing when we use words like mind or intention, imagination, all the rest of them? So that is, a theory of mind, or anything else for that matter, has to begin with a theory of language, and all, the all-important theory of language, so that we know what we're doing when we're making a theory, which is, after all, just a bunch of words. All right, and that is the end of this bunch of words. Uh, thank you for listening. As always, let me know if you have any comments or questions. Bye.